Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we blast through Barstow with two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, five sheets of high-powered blotter acid, a salt shaker half full of cocaine, and a whole galaxy of multicolored uppers, downers, screamers, and laughers. I am Ryan Peverly, your party host, the merry prankster conducting this magic school bus further into your spiritual awakening. And this bus is magical because it's running on the power of love, gliding across that ear canal of yours at a speed of 528 hertz. Hey, this bus is also running on your support and your donations. And a huge thank you to the show's number one occult fan, Nathan Lee Miller Foster. You've heard him here twice already as a guest. Our third podcast together, BTW, already in development. And Nathan Lee has decided to transmute his physical and spiritual self by donating to the show monthly at our alchemist level, $7.77 a month. Nathan Lee, in the spirit of the peaks that are twin, may I say to you, Another round of gratitude is in store for my man, Sir D.H. Slammer, Baron of the No Agenda Roundtable. The good Baron made a one-time donation in the amount of $33.33. Thank you so much, Sir D.H. Slammer. We don't have fancy titles for our supporters here at O'Culture like they do over at No Agenda, but if we did, I'd bestow upon you the title of the Courageous Magus. Thank you for your courage as well, kind sir. Both the donations from these fine men will keep our merry band together for another couple of months. And speaking of courage and kind sirs, our guest here this fine day is the ever-kind and ever-courageous Ed Liu. Ed is the host of Psychedelic Milk, one of my favorite podcasts and the most downloaded psychedelic podcast on iTunes. Ed's approach is fresh and clean like an outcast song. His podcast covers psychedelics from a more intimate perspective. Ed takes listeners along on his personal journey of self-discovery and development from episode to episode. It's definitely more spirituality than science, which is rare in the psychedelic podcast niche. But that's what we're all about here at O'Culture. Ed is joining us all the way from Hong Kong to drop this oral illustration of spiritual stimulation. So let's go to our vulnerable space and curl up by this all-chemical fire. Because when Ed and I are on the microphone, you best to wear your sweater. Because this one's cooler than a polar bear's toenails. Oh hell, there I go again, talking that shit. So let's just bend corners like we're a curve and cast this pod off into the center of that nerve. Because your ear holes are about to get served. Enjoy! First of all, thanks for taking the time here. I know you're super busy. No, man. I'm honored to have you invite me on your show. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And I'm really happy to do these because usually I'm on the other side of the conversation. So I'm, I'm more than happy to be here, man. Yeah, and I'm psyched, to use a pun, I guess, psyched to have you here just because uh, <laughs> I was going through a, a phase probably last summer or early fall where i was like man i want to find out what's new in the psychedelic community and that that's when i found your show and i'm glad i did because such a great show you have such a great approach to it i just want to talk maybe just a little bit about the genesis of psychedelic milk i mean this is the this is the number one ranked psychedelic podcast in the world is that right well we are number one and it's the psychedelic podcasting realm isn't very big and there's only a few podcasts out there and every one of us are doing different things some of us are taking the very medicinal approach which is they only talk about the medicinal benefits and things like that it's very scientific and there are others that are taking more of the spirituality realm and there is psychedelic milk which kind of takes the best of both worlds and we combine it we make it fun we make it entertaining and we are probably the most downloaded psychedelic podcast on iTunes right now. So I'm really happy about that. And, you know, I'm thrilled that people are actually liking the show because this show started with really little listeners. And I guess we're about a year in, a little bit more than a year in now. And I think we're on the right path and we're attracting a lot of people from all over the world. And people are just interested in this topic. And there's a lot of people hungry for this kind of information. And I'm glad people like you found the show. And I'm glad people are listening, tuning in and having interest in these topics, because I feel like this is a topic that's really fascinating. And you talk about a genesis of the show. And the reason why I want to start the show to begin with is because, you know, psychedelics is so interesting. You know, it's it's a combination of many worlds and 
you know, you're in the occult world and you know how deep the rabbit hole goes. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of the same thing with psychedelics. It's that the more psychedelics you take or the more you meditate, the more you dive in into this rabbit hole, the more you find out. There's more to find out. And I just feel like this is a really interesting topic. But then when I started the show, there wasn't a lot of psychedelic podcasts around. And even if there were, it wasn't very interesting. It was a very scientific approach to things, which I totally respect. And I think there is a place for that. And I feel like this topic could use some entertainment value and could really attract more people that are interested in the storylines and the, the entities and all these different anomalies that are happening around psychedelics versus just the scientific approach which which is fine but sometimes rather dry so i wanted to take a more entertaining value approach into psychedelic milk and i feel like we're totally doing that and you know we attract a whole different audience than the scientific approach guys and i feel like we're all doing a part to raise awareness in this psychedelic realm yeah man and you know just from my perspective if i had to take a guess why your show has become so popular it's because i mean not only do you have great guests and you've had quite a bit of guests that anybody i think would love to talk to about anything you know like dennis mckenna duncan trussell uh ben greenfield Corey allen tim scully was probably my favorite show that you've done so far it's also because you approach these guests who are well known in the psychedelic community from a personal standpoint you really want to it seems like you really want to get to know them and their story and their journey And it's not just about sharing science, you know, it's about really digging into the heart of who they are and and how they've been affected by their own experiences. And I kind of take that same approach with this show is, you know, it's, it's really cool to talk about alchemy or magic or UFOs or whatever, but I really want to know more about you and why you're into this stuff and how it's impacted your life, how it's changed your life. And I think you do the same thing on your show. And I think that's why I gravitated toward it and why why others do as well. And I also <laughs> like that you're not afraid to put yourself out there and share your life and your experiences with your listeners. And, you know, just in, uh, a couple weeks ago, I remember listening to a show that you did about a recent DMT trip that you had. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really cool. And your insights, both in the moment afterward and a couple weeks later, were so great. And I was wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing just a a brief recap of that dmt trip and the insights you gathered because i'm not sure how many people in my audience would be familiar with what that experience is like yeah so i had two dmt trips that night it was actually about a month and a half ago from today and i had it in my friend's balcony and when it comes to psychedelics sense setting is very important and the set is basically what you come in with, what are your intentions, what is your mood, what is going on in your life. And the setting is obviously the location of where you're doing it. And when I was going into that trip, I was really nervous. I just broke up my girlfriend. Uh, My uncle was in the hospital dying. There are a lot of things happening. And I was going into that trip with a intention of learning more about the universe because I feel like the rug is being dragged under my feet. And I was I had nowhere to stand. Everything was falling apart, it seems like. So I kind of wanted the universe to show me what's going on, what is the meaning of life, and all those great things. And when I smoked the DMT, I was just blasted into a a whole other realm. I was in a different video game almost. I mean, I kind of view life sometimes as a video game. I don't like the analogy of life as a video game because (laughs) I don't think it is. But, you know, that's the best really comparison I can make is that when we're playing this game that I called Ed or Psychedelic Milk or whatever, I was taken into a whole different universe when I smoked DMT and I saw mandalas that I didn't even know were mandalas. I saw all these imagery. I saw jokers and jesters and little spirits and entities laughing at me, joking around with me. They didn't seem evil or anything like that. They just seemed like they were having fun and ultimately I saw some kind of white light and I've seen this before. And the light was so strong that I thought it was a sun. I thought it was burning my skin. And then I encountered some alien beings that I didn't even see their their faces. I just saw their hands. And at that point, I thought my friend was messing with me from from the balcony. So I opened my eyes a little bit to check if he was indeed messing with me. And he wasn't. He was looking to the other direction. And I closed my eyes again. And then um, 
the aliens were back basically doing some operation or whatever and i felt them blow some kind of smoke at me i felt really healed for lack of a better word i don't like to use that word too much but i felt like they were doing some kind of operation some kind of work and when they blew the smoke at me my body temperature actually dropped because my body temp actually rose quite a bit when the the bright light came and then i felt my body cool down and my nerves went down my heart rate went down i was just really calm at that point and then i kind of woke up from the trip after about five minutes exactly and then my immediate reaction was go back in i want to see more of that i want to experience more of those even though it was really intense and it was quite scary because you're in the occult world and you must have i guess experiences with people talking about ufo abduction experience and stuff like that and that's what it felt like. It felt like that, and it wasn't fun. It wasn't Disneyland. It was quite scary. I mean, I felt like somebody was messing with me, <laughs> multiple people. And uh, I wanted to go back, and I went back after about two minutes of break. And then I saw this world of glowing chromatic colors, and there were people that were kind of in cord cardboard fashion. I don't know if that made sense, but they were kind of like a playing cards like the king and queen and um all those characters were alive and but they were in two-dimensional form all in chromatic all in little cardboard cutout shapes and then i was just taking on this ride where it was like the small small world in disneyland <laughs> as lame as that sounds and then it was completely beautiful and it was really different than the first trip and then when the trip ended i saw time and space folding into a card box and then it faded into blackness. And then that's when I opened my eyes and I was blown away by the incredible imagery and the beauty of that scenery. I mean, I couldn't make that up. I couldn't even imagine it in my head if I wanted to. And it was just quite an incredible experience. And I couldn't really digest what just happened to me. And I thought it was appropriate to crack out the mics and start recording with my friend because... I really wanted to record those raw emotions because with DMT, you forget things so quickly. It's like a really quick dream that once you're out of the trip, things start losing, like memory starts going away. And those memories are really precious. But at the same time, you don't want to hold on to it and make it your own identity, which I feel like a lot of people do. Like they go through a mystical experience or a peak experience, and then they want to identify with it with their their who they are or their spirit animal or whatever the case may be and they would get a tattoo of it or whatever and that's cool you know i think that's a whole different thing but i just felt like i wanted to capture the moment capture my emotions and capture what it meant and i feel like a lot of people out there that are contemplating on smoking dmt they can kind of have a glimpse of what it's like and even though it comes nothing even close to what it's really like. I mean, they kind of have an idea of what goes on and what happens to you afterwards because DMT is one of those drugs where once you're done with a trip, you're completely sober. I mean, yeah, you might be a little wheezy and, and drowsy for five more minutes, but it's not like alcohol or mushrooms or LSD where you kind of have this after effect. But with DMT, you snap back into reality really quickly. So I feel like I want it my audience to know because there's actually a lot of people that have never done psychedelics that listen to the podcast but they're just interested in these things and they're interested in mysteries and i feel like a lot of us are interested in things that we don't know and i thought it was the perfect moment to capture the emotions and the the, the vibe of what i was going through and of course i did a recap afterwards about two weeks later digesting the trip of course i still don't know what the trip means and how all the puzzles fit together i don't think i'll ever know but i can kind of put it in terms of the context that i'm living in now and how i'm learning from the experience and how i'm benefiting from the knowledge that the entities brought me and stuff like that so it's it's a really fun experience and i don't recommend everybody try dmt i mean number one thing is it's really hard to get you really need to know people to to get the hookups for DMT. And number two is, you know, you have to be ready for it. You can't just have have like a, a night out with the boys and drink alcohol and be like, oh, I got some DMT here. Let's smoke it. You know, you have to really prepare your mind and body for these type of journeys because it does change your life. You know, I was just talking to my friend the other day and he said, basically, he took DMT one time. It was really intense. It was so intense that he 
doesn't think he'll touch DMT again. So, you know, things like this happen. Also heard people dying from DMT when they smoke it alone. Somehow they forget to breathe or something like that and they just pass out and nobody saves them. So it's it's not for everybody and there are some precautions to be taken. So I highly don't recommend everybody take DMT, but it's definitely something that you guys can do your own research and be smart about it. Just have some common sense about it. But, you know, it's a really precious thing and we really don't know what it is and what we are seeing. But there are overlapping reports of people seeing the same entities and the same abduction scene in a DMT trip, which is I find completely interesting and mysterious because like are those entities living in another dimension or are they just hallucinations are they just chemicals being processed by our brains like there's so many questions that we can't answer at this moment and that's one of the most fun things about psychedelics is that the mystery that binds everything together like we still have no idea what's going on and i think that's one of the most fascinating things about psychedelics is that the the mystery of it all and for us to embrace the mystery that's the fun part absolutely man and i had a i had a guest on recently that talked about meditating while on dmt and the the entities that he encountered while doing so and it does seem like these entities are unique to dmt experiences and i think rick strassman said as much as in his book the spirit molecule right that that some people who claim to have alien abduction experiences may have just had massive amounts of dmt spontaneously released by their brain but i'm not sure how that would happen like do we know what triggers the release of dmt besides like a near-death experience can we induce the natural release of that somehow or is it yeah. just spontaneous that like, like there are said? cases where it's it's naturally released it actually happened to me once i believe of course i don't know because i'm not doing any ana- analysis of my brain at that point but there are anomalies that we can't explain because There are reports of mass alien abduction stories where me and you could be in a room and we see the same thing. So I really don't believe that me and you are having a DMT dump at that point. I mean, what are the chances that me and you are experiencing a natural DMT dump at the same time and same place? I mean, I think the chances are very slim, but... Those are the ones that I'm interested in because, yeah, of course, you can have a DMT dump any time of the day if you're lucky. But what are the chances that a few people or family are seeing the exact same aliens or whatever the case may be? It's either that or all of them are lying. But, of course, we'll never know the truth. But, I mean, I'm open to the possibilities. Yeah, it's so hard. I've talked to people that have had near-death experiences, too, and they've just relayed that same sort of experience you know going through the light the light tunnel and then being greeted on the other side by beings of some sort that they're not human they're not well what we would think of as as aliens but they're they're just they're just entities that are there waiting for them and kind of like what you said you know they're they're kind of trickster figures almost you know where they just kind of like to to fuck around with you i guess which hey if that's what the next realm is after this one if it's just a bunch of people playing pranks on each other i'm all for that (laughs) Um, I'm down for that, man. I mean, yeah. that that sounds fun to me. Absolutely, man. I know that you you talked about lucid dreaming with some people on your show too, and I've never ever had a lucid dream experience, but I did have a dream recently that stuck with me. And it was very simple. In the dream, I had dropped a couple tabs of LSD. Oh wow! And I That's was. Cool. W- yeah, and I was waiting for the trip. Like I, I knew in the dream I was I was waiting for these tabs to kick in. I was ready to blast off, right? And then <laughs> right when I felt like I was going to blast off on this trip, I woke up. And for Damn. some reason, <laughs> for some reason, the I, worst thought, trip ever. <laughs> I thought I thought I yeah, I thought in that moment that was so fucking profound and insightful <laughs> that right when I wake up is when that trip starts in the dream and I thought, "Well, shit, man." Like this yeah. right here, this life that I'm living right now, this is the trip. And it's kind of like a reverse psychedelic experience of sorts. But you ever experience trippy, anything like man. that? You know, like where you just – because I don't do a lot of psychedelics. I have to put that out there. I've had a handful of experiences and not any recent ones either. It was several years ago. I'd like to have more though as I continue to learn more about it and, and talk to folks like you and listen to folks like you. But have you ever had any experiences like that where – you're not on anything. You're not even meditating. You're, I guess the dream state is, is very hard to, to parse through in terms of what it is. But I wasn't under the influence of anything. I'm just sleeping and then 
to just have that sort of insight like well shit like this realm this thing i'm experiencing right now is, is not not real at all yeah yeah i've had experience where i talked about earlier where i had a dmt dump is it's a funny story because i was in hawaii in my house and there were some lava rocks downstairs that were buried on a under the mud and we dug it up and we put it under some trees and plants and it looked pretty i think they're like obsidian rocks or crystals but a complete natural formed by lava they're really cool looking they're not these like crystals you buy at crystal shops where they're all cut it up nicely they look, yeah. look perfect these are rough ones they're per- they are from the ground they're really natural i'm not sure how many people even touch them so we put it under the, the trees and plants it looked pretty and one day i was watering the, the plants and i th- I was touching the crystal i was like wow this is a really cool crystal i was just appreciating the crystal and i gave it some water i put it down again and went back upstairs and i was laying on the edge of my bed my bed is just on the ground there's no like actual frame or whatever so it's just laying on the ground and i was laying on the edge of the bed not sleeping not napping i think it was like 4 p.m and all of a sudden i find myself in in darkness and I kind of knew it was a dream state. I see a bright light, really intense, really just this crazy radiating light full of energy. And when I saw the light, I was like, wow, this is really interesting. It was really fascinating. I've never seen something like this before. And uh, something inside of me told me, hey, why don't you just go in the light? Because it looks like it's filled with energy. So I went into the light and I was just charged. I mean, I was super sane for about five seconds. I was experiencing the most intense orgasm in my whole body, mind and spirit for about five to ten seconds. And then it was so intense that I had to get out because I couldn't handle it. And I got out of the light and I was like, wow, that was amazing. What was that? And I was just completely blown away and then i was like hey why not go into the light again so i did that about four or five times and then all of a sudden i just woke up and i find myself on the edge of the bed and i was like hey i wasn't even sleeping i wasn't even napping what was i doing where what where did i go because i don't nap in the afternoons and i wasn't wasn't really sleepy at that time so i remember that really vividly where i was just kind of chilling in my bedroom and all of a sudden I was taken into this darkness and I see this light and I knew it was like a dream state or it wasn't actual reality that we call real and there was this light interacting with me and it was really fascinating and you know recently I've been waking up at about 6 a.m. I usually get up about 7 30 to go to work and stuff and then I just get up at around 6 nowadays for whatever reason maybe the sun is too bright and then I kind of look at my clock and I go back to sleep. And then I would start having these really weird dreams. Recently, I interviewed a veteran on my show that had ayahuasca experiences and how he was using ayahuasca to treat his um, PTSD and stuff like that. And that really left a, a huge remark for me because I thought it was one of the best podcasts I've ever done because, you know, here's a guy that went to combat and went through all these different things. And for him to come on the show and talk about his experiences, talk about ayahuasca, it was really incredible for me. It was really eye opening and it meant a lot to me. I thought it was one of the, the most meaningful podcasts I've ever recorded. It was just awesome. And somehow I remember that podcast when I woke up at 6 a.m. And then I just went back to sleep afterwards. And then when I went back to sleep, I had a military dream. I mean, (laughs) I was in some kind of military zone. And these things would happen all the time. Sometimes I'll wake up, I'll think about a certain thing. Let's say I think about tarot cards or whatever. And then I'll go back into the dreamland and tarot cards would appear. So I'm gaining some kind of awareness in a dream where I can implant that idea at 6 a.m. and for an hour and a half I will be dreaming about that topic and of course I'm really a beginner at this so I want to be better at it and I want to be more in control of those dreams for that one hour and a half so it's really interesting that you mentioned that because I've been thinking about that today quite a bit because if I can kind of put a, a notepad on my beside my bed and have some topics laid out and when i wake up at 6 a.m i look at those topics maybe i'll go back into the dreamland and living those topics maybe that will work i don't know maybe i should try that tonight (laughs) well yeah and when you really start to research lucid dreams and then how to 
how to have them, you know, like how to train yourself to have them. That's, mm-hmm. that's one thing they tell you is to set an alarm for a certain time in the morning, right. wake up and then focus on whatever you want to go into and then go back to sleep. Right. So yeah. you've, you've apparently been doing that. That's pretty cool. But the thing is like, I'm not exactly lucid though in those dreams like the military dream i wasn't 100 percent lucid i kind of had an idea like this wasn't 100 percent real but i still couldn't control everything you know what i mean like, i was still going through the robotic motions that you would go through during a dream i was just taking on that ride but what i like to do is be able to fly or swim underwater or whatever the case may be but to be honest with you i'm just kind of lazy to do that it takes a lot of work to <laughs> Yeah. to be in a lucid dream like when i'm sleeping i want to have full rest i want to have the sleep be real sleep and not flying or swimming or having sex with a girl or whatever like i actually want to rest so if lucid co- lucid dreaming comes naturally then I- i'm more than welcome to have it but i'm not going to go and chase it because i'm, I'm just a lazy guy and i want my rest <laughs> yeah lucid yeah it's a lot of hard work to be awake in your dreams right Speaking of waking up, we see this we see this phrase all around social media, woke. I know you've used it on your show. I've talked to people about it and and it's it's such a it's such a weird phrase to me. It's it's actually kind of starting to annoy me. I don't know why, but I well, I think I know why. It's it's because the people that use this phrase or phrases like that, I don't think they are what they say they are. Because well, like so what does Can you give me an example of who people like the people that are using those terms? I don't know, about 25% of the population on Instagram, for example. You know, like... Um, uh, like what subcategory would that be? What subcategory would that be? That's a good question. I don't know if I could subcategorize these people as one thing. It's just people who post, you know, uh, memes about love and light, <laughs> peace and awareness. And it's just like, I'm all for that message of spreading positivity, all right? That's, that's not right. my issue. My issue is that... <laughs> well, first of all, what does woke even mean? Like, what are these people alluding to? Did I they... think it means that you're awakened to the paradigm that is trying to manipulate you in a certain way. So I think what they're talking about, and I use it sometimes too, because it's a great term. It's like... It represents a lot of things that you would have to explain otherwise. But, you know, sometimes in society or in life, we we are attuned to a certain type of propaganda and we are supposed to buy into certain things and we're supposed to live life a certain way. And when we take the red pill, that's another term that people like to use. We yeah. we become awakened to that. We become more aware of the things that are going on. We become of the propaganda and the manipulation and the Machiavellian tactics that are trying to manipulate us into a certain way of life. And when we stop doing that and we resist that way of life or we invent our own way of life, we are quote unquote woke and I know what you mean. There's a lot of people that are abusing that term. Quite frankly, I don't mind it because I'd rather people use that than some other term because if a teenager is growing up and he's seeing all these memes about woke or red pill, he's going to look into it. He's going to investigate what these terms mean. And some terms are going to be better than others, but he's going to come into the conclusion of, hey, this means that the government or society or Hollywood or whatever the case may be are trying to tell us a message, trying to spin things a certain way. And people are waking up to the fact and people aren't being dummies to the system anymore. So I feel like it's doing a lot of good. Of course, there's going to be idiots everywhere that are going to be misusing the word or whatever. But I know what you mean. There's a lot of love and light people that are out there um, saying that they're woke and red pilled and how they're better than everybody else to me it's just another form of narcissism saying hey i'm woke and you're not so i'm better than you because yeah. i've read more books i've meditated more i've done more yoga i've taken more lsd and i encountered this a lot in the psychedelic community and quite frankly i was i was quite mad about it when i first got into the community because I thought this was kind of some kind of elitism. It's, it's really a type of psychedelic identity politics, which I've talked about many times. People want to identify themselves with certain things because they lack an identity of their own. And they want to make themselves an elitist without even knowing it. Because when you're on psychedelics or you're on a path of spirituality or you're on a woke path, so to speak, 
you have a blind spot. You have a huge blind spot of not knowing that you are being an elitist and narcissist to many people. And when you're talking to other people about how woke you are, you're actually telling the other person how asleep that they are and how unenlightened they are. So they should follow what they're doing and eat what they're eating and all these crazy things. And I really don't believe in that at all. I I believe that everybody has the right to do whatever they want as long as they're not harming other people. And they shouldn't force their ideologies onto other people. And now I'm more mature into this topic. And I'm not, not as mad about these people as I once was because there was a period of time where I was just pissed at these hypocrites about, you know, vegans or meditators or whatever the case may be. I don't care if you're a vegan, if you meditate. I meditate. I do yoga. I do LSD. I do all those things. I'm not a vegan, but you shouldn't be telling people what to do with their lives. And I felt like those people of all people should know that they should have a better understanding of letting people live for their values, even though they might be different than yours. And then I came into the realization that I was actually the elitist because I had the higher expectation of these people in the spiritual community having higher expectations. You know what I mean? So I was like, I thought they were better because we take psychedelics and we meditate and we do yoga. So we should think better. We should have a less cognitive dissonance. But that was my cognitive dissonance where I thought we are better than other people. So you know what? People are people and people in every community are going to be idiots and there's going to be blind spots everywhere. It doesn't matter which community or how much psychedelics you're going to be taking or how much animals that you're not eating. So I'm no no longer mad about these issues. I just kind of accept it as part of life and, and the day goes on. I think the more mad about I am about these things, it's not going to help anything. It's just going to, you know, it's just going to slow down my path. Yeah, and I, I think that was the point that I was trying to get to was that it, it seems like it's just another way for people to divide against each other, woke versus unwoke, you know, or awake versus sleep, that sort of thing. It does seem rather egotistical to me to parade your wokeness around on the internet. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's just yeah. my perception of it. Now, maybe everyone isn't doing that from a place of, of ego, but right. I think if you've had some sort of spiritual awakening and you're just showing it off on on Instagram for the sake of showing people how woke you are, I think that sort of belittles the experience that that you've had. But maybe you haven't had a true spiritual awakening. I mean, did you have that? Or did you just... Do you just think you're awake now because you heard Alex Jones talking about 9-11 and pedophilia? <laughs> but, but here's the thing. We also have to take into consideration of the context that they created the Instagram post in. I was actually talking to Corey Allen about this a week ago. And the way that he takes Instagram is very different than I take Instagram. He takes Instagram a lot more serious than I do, meaning he would actually write something for about an hour on another notepad or whatever. And then he'll go over it. It looks good. It means something to him. And then he'll post it on Instagram, find a picture that correlates to the writings and and voila, here's his work of art. And I totally respect that. What I do is I don't take Instagram that seriously. It's a form of communication. People look at a Mona Lisa for about 11 seconds on average. And that's at France. And we were actually talking about the Mona Lisa and how he was captivated by the Mona Lisa, Corey Allen. And then... I looked up the statistics for people looking at the Mona Lisa. It's actually about 10 to 12 seconds. So can you think about an Instagram post? Can you think about how many people or how much time people are spending looking at your post? And the reality is not that much. So I'm not going to post an entire paragraph or a story or a book on my Instagram because people are just scrolling through it. That's the medium of Instagram. It's meant to be looked at really quickly and scrolled through. So sometimes I'll just write something stupid or something fun, something woke, and I'll just post it for fun. And people like it, people don't like it. I don't really care. I've had posts where people got so mad at me for posting an Alex Jones meme that I've just detached from the situation now. Like I don't care. I, I don't take Instagram that seriously. It's a form of communication. It's fun. And I, th- I feel like a lot of people also aren't taking it so seriously. Of course, there are other people that are really, you know, taking it to the heart and and criticizing and judging other people based on their Instagram posts. And I feel like that's a mistake. And I feel like if you don't know the person in real life, 
you don't know their way of communication, you don't know their humor, so you shouldn't judge them for their <laughs> Instagram posts only. So I feel like it all depends on the context. When I post on Instagram, it's all for fun, it's all for kicks. But there's definitely people that take it really seriously and mean what they say on Instagram. So yeah, I feel like we should really base it on the context and and what the person's intention is when they make the post. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So let me pose a question to you then on this same topic. So you've had spiritual experiences. You would consider yourself awake to, like you said, this paradigm <laughs> that, that, that you live in. Now, obviously, your first obligation is to make sense of that for yourself, You know, to, to process these lessons that, that you've taken from these experiences and, and figure out what it means to you and for you. After you do that, though, and that's really a never-ending process, so I can't really say after you do that. Like, it's not, it's, it's not ever done. But when you start to make sense of it, what then is your obligation to other people, you know, to the people in your direct circle, to people that, that you love and care about? And then what's your obligation to your podcast listeners, to society at large? Like, where do you see your role in that after you've went through a, a transcendence, you know, sort of experience? Well, first of all, I don't think I'm awake. That's number one. And okay. I feel like that's a trap that a lot of people fall into. They take ayahuasca or they come back from Peru or they take DMT and all of a sudden I'm awake. I'm alive. I'm enlightened. I'm hashtag blessed. And I feel like that's a huge <laughs> misunderstanding yeah, I, I, I because a too, it's a forever, blessed. it's a forever learning process. I mean, there's no way that I could become awake. You know, in this lifetime, I don't think that's my goal for sure. But I mean, I don't think that I'm even close to it. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that have never taken sake that like still are more awake than I am. They have so much more wisdom than I do. And every time I learn something new, I'm humbled by the knowledge and the wisdom that tells me, hey, you don't actually know anything. I mean, sometimes you might have an idea or an opinion about certain things, but you really don't know anything. But I certainly know what you mean when you have a psychedelic experience. You feel like you have learned a lot because you went through a spiritual experience. And I know what you mean by that. And, um, you know, around my friends, I don't really talk about it. There's only one friend that I talked about psychedelics with, and he's Pat, and he's the guy that I smoked DMT with. Other than that, nobody else wants to hear about psychedelics because all of my friends are kind of like normal people. You know, they're, they, they're not spiritual people. They're not into occult. They're not into uh, the mysteries of life. Of course, there are some um, that are in my yoga community. But for my really close friends, they don't really talk about it. But, you know, whenever they encounter problems in life and they come to me for help or they ask me for my opinion, I try to answer them with the best knowledge available to me that are gathered from reading books or having psychedelic experiences or just having life lessons in general as a matter of fact somebody one of my friends just broke up with the boyfriend or whatever or the boyfriend broke up with her and she was crying and she she came for me for, to help or whatever and i was like telling her all these theories and these philosophies and I was telling her you're just clinging on to fear and everything that you're experiencing right now is a facade. It's an illusion. It's nothing but a dream. It's really minute to many other problems that we're experiencing in the world. And what you're going through is just a learning process. It's a learning experience. As a matter of fact, it's good for you that you're going through this because you're going to gain something from this. You're you're, you might be heard right now, but this is one of the best lessons to go through is life. Life is the best teacher. And when I said that to her, she just told me, hey, that's a lot of bullshit philosophies, right? <laughs> right now, I'm just a crying yeah. girl that just broke up with a boyfriend. Let me cry. And I was like, okay, I'll leave you alone. Yeah, man. So, you know, a lot I... of people don't like to listen to this kind of stuff. Yeah. And no, I, I've had I the same to... experience, by the way. And I'm guessing that all you really need to say was, everything's going to be okay, right? Yeah, and I mean, that's all you got to do, man. That's all you really have to do. And I'm trying to learn the best way to approach these problems that people are encountering and how I, sh I should help calm them down. So like I was talking about my dying uncle earlier. Um, he was pretty much dying at his deathbed a couple of weeks ago. He's alive now, so he made it. But anyways, the whole family was there. It was a really just gloomy scene at the hospital room. And 
at that time, I just came back from a DMT trip. So I had this innate sense of calmness. I knew that everything was going to be okay. I have sort of experienced death on that DMT trip. I knew what it was going to be like on the other side. I met the aliens. I know who God is. I'm woke, baby. So I was there <laughs> just really calm and confident and accepting. And I just gave my aunt a hug. And I was like, everything is going to be okay, no matter what happens. If we accept the worst possible outcome, which is death, then everything else will be okay. And I have accepted the worst possible outcome in the hospital room because I have just experienced it twice on DMT. So I knew in a sense what it was going to be like. So I had this sense of calmness. And I think people can feel it when you're calm instead of being fearful. So that's what I try to do these days. Whenever something crazy happens in the world or terrorist attack or whatever the case may be, people on the podcast, they're hysterical, they're looking for answers. And I just try to be as calm as I can. And everything is going to be okay because no matter what happens at the end is the worst possible outcome is death. That's not that bad. That's part of life. That's the process we go through. That's just another process of life that we live. And death is a part of it. And if that is the worst possible outcome that we can ever experience, then that is okay to me. So that's what I do now, man. I just realized we're in this grand game of 99 dimensional chess and we have no fucking idea what's going on. We're barely a pawn. And there is many magical things working in this world that are forces around us. And the more we think about it, the more we dwell on the negativity, the more we try to manipulate our environment or people around us, the more suffering we're going to go through. So it's just the best way to go through life is just have this sense of confidence that everything is going to be okay and enjoy the ride. So that's where I'm at currently. And it might change minute to minute. I might be the hysterical one a week from now. So <laughs> it all depends. I mean, right now, like you're, you're catching me at a good time because I'm going in and out of the hospital every day. I'm consulting all these friends that are going through breakups, including my own. So I'm seeing a lot of problems in my life happening and I'm seeing a lot of death. I'm seeing a lot of sadness. And But I can tell you something, man, that I've never been in a better mood because through all this sadness and all the, all these witnessing of death, I have just accepted everything that is going to come to you in life. And the only thing that we can control is ourselves. And if we can control how we look at life and how we interpret things and our mood and if we want to live life with a smile or not, it's really up to you. Nobody can take that from you. That is your special power. And that is something that I had to learn because I wasn't always like this. I was very much of a pessimist and I've never been in a better mood, man. I smile every day now. I'm just a really cheerful person at this moment of time because of all those negativity, because of death, because everything seems like it was falling apart. It forces you to find happiness. And I feel like that is one of the best things to ever happen is that when life wants to teach us a lesson, we really have to take notes and learn. We really have to pay attention and open our hearts to take in those lessons because they don't come around very often. These opportunities to learn, they're so precious. They're, they're directly from source, from God, from the universe or whatever you want to call it. And it is a blessing for me, for real, to go through these things and learn from it. And I'm just so happy. I'm so grateful that things are happening and there's so much synchronicities going on around me as well that I feel like I'm on the right path. I feel like these things are little Easter eggs that the universe is throwing at me. Of course, that's quite an egotistical and narcissistic thing to say because what the universe is planning around you or your mindset, of course not. But that's just the way I like to rationalize my life. Yeah. <laughs> so it gives me it gives me hope. It gives me happiness. And I find joy in that. So I think I feel like as long as I'm finding joy in what I do or my current mode of thinking or mindset, then it's really worth it. Yeah, and you you see a phrase uh, that I'm reminded of in the occult. It's mostly used in a nefarious conspiratorial way, but you know, out of chaos order, and that's kind of what we're talking about. Is you you suffer through these experiences, but when you get through them. You do find, you know, bliss or peace or happiness. I, I went through a traumatic breakup a couple years ago, and then a year ago, my my grandfather passed away, who I was really close to. So, 
that all happened, you know, consecutively in my life. And I had just these really painful experiences, you know, lost love, lost family member that I was close to. But I learned more about myself in those experiences than I ever had. And I'm actually grateful that I was able to go through them. And I don't think a lot of people would see it that way, you know? Like, we all have people in our lives that are attached to things. They have problems letting go of things. They're emotional hoarders. I don't know if you would yeah. agree with me. You know, like, that's just there's people that just cling to things because it's safe and it's comfortable. And they're suffering because of that. And they don't realize that if you just fucking let go of it, you know... Go on that trip, you know, don't hold yourself back, you know, it's, I think you would probably know what I'm talking about, right, where you're, you're kind of, uh, were you ever afraid to go on a psychedelic journey, you know, like, where you're like, well, I'm gonna do mushrooms, I'm gonna do LSD, but you feel like you're holding yourself back from actually going on the trip, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Yeah, absolutely, there's, there's fear controlling us every second of our lives, and the, the key is to acknowledge it and have some awareness about it and not let it control you anymore, and I feel like, it's a never ending practice because the more you try to deny fear, the more it's going to control you and come back and bite your ass. But you have to acknowledge that fact that, hey, it's there and it's going to try to manipulate me. It's going to try to control my actions, but I don't have to feed it. I don't have to give into it. So acknowledge, but not feed it. And that's the key. And it's easier said than done because, you know, there are, there are times where I'm just scared to do certain things because I don't want to hurt my ego and things like that. But it's a learning process for me that I think I'm still going through quite a bit and I'm learning every day how to encounter fear in a better way and how to not let my ego get into the way so much because I feel like a large part of fear has to deal with the ego because you don't want to hurt your ego. You know, you don't want to take that psychedelic trip or mushroom because it's going to crush your ego. It's going to show you things that you do not want to know sometimes. And it's going to show you how your ego has been obstructing you all along and how your ego was really your worst enemy sometimes. Of course, I don't want to demonize the ego, which a lot of people in this community want to do is they want to say the ego is the complete enemy and things like that. And I completely disagree. I feel like it's a force that is within us that we have to live with. It's kind of like money. You know, people like to say money is bad as root of evil. I disagree. It's a tool. If used nicely, it could buy you a lot of great things. It could feed a lot of people. And just like with the ego, if you use it in the right context and with healthy intentions, you could build a lot of cool stuff with it. You can make a lot of cool inventions. You could drive yourself into the top dog of your company and just be successful and have a great family and and even feed some kids if you want to. You know, there's a lot of great things you could do with your ego. It's not just killing other people or manip manipulating other people, whatever the case may be. So I don't know why I got into the ego track, but well, it's part of fear. I definitely, you know? That's what, yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. You know, like fear, there's a large, we're, we're mostly ruled by fear and that's, I just watched star Wars recently, the old ones mm -hmm. and they talk about fear a lot. And that's the thing that I have to realize sometimes because like sometimes I like to drown myself in negative news or these day to day events that are happening around the world. And, I like to have a very passionate outlook on things, but ultimately these things are all driven by fear. And if we're controlled by fear, like Yoda said, we'll be led to the dark side. And I certainly don't want that. And um, that's why I've been channeling my energy a lot more to positive side of things and just happier things because it's so easy to give in to fear. That's the easy path. It's the lazy path, but it takes effort and time and awareness to really direct your life back into the path of courage and and just positivity. I know that sounds really cheesy and corny. Oh, yeah, that'd be love and light and positivity. But, you know, there is some truth to that. And I feel like sometimes the Instagrammers are ruining that for us and because they're posting too much yoga memes of positivity and stuff. But <laughs> these things are true, man. You know, these things, they hold value. And um you know, I don't like those Instagram posts when they cheese it up too much, but I can't let that get into the way of me finding my own happiness. You know what I mean? So I got to do what I got to do. I have to find the light side or the right path for myself.
Hey, let's get a little weird right now, if you don't mind. <laughs> let's um, do it. We'll start with not too weird, but have you heard the theory that psychedelics poke holes in the aura? In the aura? Yeah. Like, no, have I haven't you heard seen that. this no. theory? Oh, man. So <laughs> look this up. You could Google like holes in aura or something like that. There's look a, that right now? Do it, man. Yeah, sure. There's a theory out there that psychedelics poke holes in the auric field. And this essentially That's weakens. Scary, man. <laughs> yeah, it, it weakens the spirit and it allows like demonic energies to take root in your aura. So okay, yeah, I'm reading some of it. Yeah, I was just curious if you've heard of that and if you believe that, if you think it's plausible, or do you think that just might be a scare tactic to keep people away from psychedelic experiences? That's a fairly new discovery on my end, too, within the last few months. I, I just kind of stumbled across that somewhere. I think I, when I was researching more into psychedelics and trying to figure out what I could do and, and how I could do it, and then I came across that. And that would give anybody pause, like, oh, shit, like, I don't want <laughs> demonic energies to take root in my auric field. But, yeah, I was just curious, like, as somebody who has done psychedelics, you have encountered entities, and not that they were demonic necessarily, but... I would think that if it is a an energetic source that, that you're experiencing, that they could attach to you and come back into this realm somehow. Do you have any thoughts on that? So first of all, just the top of my head, because of course I haven't done any research or asked any shamans about this topic, but I have to believe that if you're doing it in a irresponsible manner, if you're partying with it, if you're not having the right intentions, then of course demonic forces or negative energy or just bad spirits could attach itself to you and become just this vampirical spirit that is living in your system. I've actually interviewed somebody that went to a full moon party and he took some LSD and he stepped on a cursed talisman and he got cursed from it. He got really sick and he had to go to a shaman in the Amazon to get it healed and the shaman in the Amazon told him that talisman was cursed from an african voodoo and his auric feed was blasted open when he was on lsd and that way was how those negative spirits and entities got into his aura or spirits or whatever you want to call it so yeah i definitely believe it's possible but i believe that if you're doing the cleansing if you're burning the incense if you're blowing the mapacho smoke if you're doing any type of spiritual cleansing before you dive deep into the deep end, I think you'll be pretty safe. Also, I think your intentions matter a lot. If you are going into the trip with, you just want to get fucked up, I just want to see auras or you want to see ghosts or whatever, then yeah, you're asking for trouble. These things aren't funny games. These things are a really serious business and you could definitely invoke a lot of negative spirits if you have those type of intentions. And... I definitely believe that, yeah, you, if you use it the wrong way, you could definitely hurt yourself. Psychedelics is a very serious business. They're a great tool. And just like any tool, you could use it for good, you can use it for bad. Even in shamanism, there's negative shamanism, like black magic, there's white magic, there's chaos magic. There are tribes in the Amazon for ayahuasca that would throw curses onto people and make people sick and fire these chaotic arrows and weapons at people and actually people get injured from them actual injuries and people have to go to the hospitals from an invisible arrow so <laughs> these psychic warfares definitely happen and it's not that kind of weird to me that psychedelics can poke holes in people's auras i don't think that once you take a psychedelic you're poking holes in your aura i don't think that's what the article means but a lot of people can definitely read it like that because for the longest time, if you take MDMA or ecstasy, they're poking holes in your brain, right? Supposedly. Yeah. Of course, that's not true. But that's kind of how the article, the headline was framed. Hey, if you take psychedelics, it's going to poke holes in your aura. I don't think that's true. If you are getting irresponsible with it or you're being an asshole, buddy, yeah, of course, and you kind of deserve it. <laughs> but if you're having a responsible use, respect the medicine, then it shouldn't because I know so much people that have benefited so great, so much from psychedelics, and I truly do not believe their auras are punctured. And if their auras are indeed punctured, then fuck, puncture mine because they're getting <laughs> so much better. You know what I mean? Like yeah. they're actually receiving a healing. They're coming back with better awareness, with better insights, with better wisdom. And I really don't believe that their auras are 
having holes in them. And if you ever talk to anybody that comes back from Peru from an ayahuasca trip, you would really recognize their aura is glowing. I mean, Mm -hmm. I can't see auras normally, but when I talk to them, I could feel it. I could feel it in the air. I could feel it in their voice, in their eyes, in in their breath. And my brother did ayahuasca, my best friend Pat did ayahuasca, and I picked him up from the airport. And I could just feel that essence of positive energy and clarity just transmuting through the air. And their aura at that point is very strong and very vibrant, very colorful. And I don't believe that a bit if you want to talk about or the article wants to talk about psychedelics 100% pokes holes in people's auras. Well, like, how would you even observe that or measure that? I mean, it it does beg the question of what what is an aura? And it, yeah, of course, <laughs> it, it, it seems like it seems like it is that sort of. I've read uh, it's that sort of like energetic bubble around you almost, where you're just sort of like it's like maybe what like a, a couple of feet that you're radiating, you know, like from your body mm-hmm. outwards. It does make me think that maybe that is some sort of protective shield or veil. That when you are on psychedelics, that, that that's lowered. So maybe you do sort of expose yourself to those those energies. But I like your point about it's all about your mindset. If, if you go into that experience knowing that you're going to be lowered, but you're positive, you're, you have good intentions, I don't think you would bring back negative energies with you. I think it's the people like you're talking about that abuse it on some level where their mindset's not not right. And maybe they're the ones that are getting these these sort of demonic energies attached to them and they're bringing them back into this realm. And then, you know, hey, maybe that's why we're so fucked up now as a society is people (laughs) have been abusing this kind of stuff for decades now. Well, Um, let me just say that your aura could be damaged even if you're not on psychedelics. I mean, have you ever walked into a room where people had so much bad energy, they were just mad or irritated or frustrated and it's contagious you walk in that room and when you walk out most of the time you become one of those people and you've ever walked in a room where people are so happy and vibrant and positive energy and they're laughing they're carefree and you walk out happier you walk out funnier and it's the same way your aura was raised or your aura was lowered it could happen when you're sober as well and I believe when you're on psychedelics, you're more sensitive to energy. So, of course, I've heard many stories where people come back from mushroom trips or DMT or LSD where they have this post-traumatic stress disorder from that trip where they experience like demonic entities and negative energies and they can't recover from it or it takes them a long time. I've definitely went through some of those things where it was really tough to recover from a mushroom trip. And maybe those are times where my aura was damaged but i feel like it's probably not permanent i mean uh, aura is like an energy field and an energy field could be fixed by more energy you know what i mean so i don't think that it's that big of a deal i feel like people that are entering psychedelic spaces with respect should already have those shielding around them if not you can perform some kind of sigil magic or whatever to protect yeah. yourself you know so i think that that'll be that'll be worth something to look into yeah, that's a good transition into what I wanted to talk about next. Um, I heard on a recent podcast you did that you have been reading up on occult symbolism and sigil magic. How new are you to the occult? And, I'm and very those green. Sorts of I'm green? very green. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I like to listen to other podcasts with uh, like occult symbologies and stuff like that. Uh, I listen to Mysterious Universe. They're a good one. Yeah. And other sigil magic books and chaos magic and stuff like that. But, you know, I really don't have any idea what it is. And it's really fascinates me of how you can manipulate time and space and behavior with some kind of spells or some kind of words that you say, like Michelangelo or whatever. I've done some of those things a couple of years ago when I didn't really know what I was doing. My friend told me about it. Hey, you should do this to the four corners of your room or to the directions of um, your house or whatever. So I've done that and I'm pretty sure I haven't done anything because I'm so new at it because you're supposed to point some kind of sword at the east and the west and say some kind of name and I didn't know what the hell I was doing (laughs) and I probably failed miserably. But I'm trying to get back into it because I feel like the world of magic is so intense and crazy that I I just want to learn more about it because it uncovers more mysteries of this universe, you know, and this opens up into a whole new discussion about free will because I was actually talking to my friend today 
about magic and free will. If you can perform magic, that means you can manipulate events happening in your life, future events. But does that mean that there's no or there's actually free will? Because if that's true, if you can manipulate stuff, then you can actually cause events to happen that are not supposed to happen. So that means that we have total control of free will in our universe or in our human bodies and minds. But sometimes I feel like we have a destiny. I feel like sometimes synchronicities happen and we are destined towards a certain direction. So I'm conflicted between the two worlds where, one, you have magicians and magic and black magic, white magic, and you can manipulate things happening. And the second one is there are all these destined things that are waiting to happen i mean you go to some kind of fortune teller or whatever they tell you things and i shit you not sometimes they get things 100 percent correct and that tells me that there's some kind of destiny in our lives so i don't know what you think about that but it's a really fascinating dilemma to me because i would love to learn magic i would love to have some kind of master that i can learn from and i feel like that is a, an area that has a lot of potential that a lot of people are putting up and saying bullshit, but I, I believe is real. I really do, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've only dabbled in it a couple of times. I, I've only done a couple of things, and I I didn't see results at first because I, I think mindset, again, and intention, very important when you do magic. And I'm not an expert on it by any means, but I've noticed that as I've approached it differently, more positively, it has begun to show results in my own life. But back to your point about, you know, free will and destiny, I tend to see things through a, a dualistic lens where, you know, black and white, like you're talking about with, with black and white magic. And I see free will and destiny in the same vein. Like there is free will, there is also fate, and both exist in a not necessarily like a 50 50 split but you know they're also mutable right like they right. like your free will can inform your fate and your fate can also present to you the choices that you must make with your free will if that makes right. any sense yeah it makes a lot of sense and what what kind of events are you causing to happen when you're performing magic i just want to ask okay so i've only done like i said a couple of things i do tarot not often, but every now and then, like when I feel like I have to, to get some sort of clarity about something or because I'm just curious, I guess, about, you know, what might be on the horizon for me or just to see if it's accurate. Because when you read tarot, it, it it's kind of a, a past, present and future. Right. You know, it kind of informs you what's recently happened to you, what's currently happening and then what what may happen. So that's what I've had the most experience with. I have seen that be very effective in terms of communicating to me what I've recently been through, what I'm currently going through, and then what I may go through that, that actually has come to fruition, you know, like in my life. Not not all the time, but right. more often than not, when I read my own tarot, which I, like I said, it's the only thing I've really been doing. I've done a couple of magical experiments, which I can talk about too. But And, oh, that actually reminds me, you, you did tarot recently too on a podcast. Yeah. Did you find any sort of truth in that? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, Sarah, who's an amazing person, did the tarot session for me, and she basically highlighted what was happening in my personal life, hashtag the breakup. And <laughs> and a few hours later, I broke up with a girlfriend. So yeah, it came into fruition in just five hours. So she was, well, hold on. Do you, she do was you dead think on. That, do you think that she... Okay, so... Yeah, prior, I know what you're trying to ask. Yeah, prior like, to do the you tarot think her suggestions are, yes, that's what are influencing my decisions? Yes, of course. But I still had to have the, the execution, I guess, to really execute it. I mean, things were happening so fast during that time. Basically, <laughs> yeah, I don't want, I don't know if you should talk about this because like people would hate me, but fuck it. So basically, she read the tarot cards and it was like, holy shit, she's right. She's dead on. It's crazy. Like I didn't believe in these things before. And then... Actually, things were okay, like on the surface between me and my ex-girlfriend, whatever. And um, there were some hidden tensions, of course. And I never had the intention of breaking up with her. But then, like, she just kind of went crazy after that session. I mean, really? she she went ham on me, hmm. and I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm just done. This is too much. Like, this is not helping me in my life. This is not what I envisioned this to be. This is a vampirical relationship where 
you're, you're sucking all the energy from me and I can't even enjoy myself while I'm here. So what is the point? And it's been happening, it's been happening, it's been happening. And then that was kind of the catalyst and it happened. And I was like, okay, I'm done. So this shit influenced my decision, maybe, probably 50%. But things had to happen for that to happen as well. So, you know, if my ex-girlfriend was like, hey, you know, saying nice things and words of encouragement and all these great things. And yeah, of course, I wouldn't break up with her from those positive things. But I mean, all of a sudden, she kind of flipped the script. And uh, so I had to I had to I had to move, you know, I had to do something about it. And, you know, I just said, uh, that's it. It's the end. I'm sorry. So did she did she influence me? Probably. But I'm also a man of my own being. So I don't think that Sarah could influence me that much. I mean, 50% is already a really conservative number or a liberal number, I should say. She probably influenced me like 25%. I mean, it was a good suggestion that she told me, but I had to make up my own mind. And things were happening so fast, I don't think I was really thinking about it too much. I was just kind of reacting to the situation. But yeah, that's what happened. This is how I look at it. You, She tapped into a decision that you already made subconsciously. You know, you yeah. probably wanted to move on from this relationship prior to talking to Sarah when she was reading your tarot and then she taps into that etheric realm of the subconscious and just communicates your own decision back to you right right yeah and then so she's not really suggesting it from her end she's suggesting it from your end she's like hey here's right. here's what you and that's that's what magic and tarot that's the high magic man yeah that's, that's some exactly high level shit <laughs> Some people might say that, oh, she's just flipping cards over and then the cards are, are archetypes that have certain meanings. But then when you really think about it, well, they are tapping into the person that's being read, you know, like I had my palm read many years ago. Right. And I didn't take it seriously. And nothing that this palmistry artist, I don't know what you would call him, palm reader, I guess. Nothing that the palm <laughs> reader told me would happen actually happened. I felt like I was, have you seen that scene in a... Uh, peewee's big adventure no you seen that movie oh shit okay now i'm i might be dating myself and i might be telling you too much about what kind of films i'm into but you know it's a, it's a tim burton movie so it's kind of weird and you know peewee herman's kind of weird obviously too and uh -huh. both in terms of character and the real person that plays him but he goes to this you know he loses his bicycle right and he goes to this palm reader because you know he's just at his wits and he's, he wants to find his fucking bike and and he's like uh <laughs> She's like, she just totally like takes him for like all he's worth. Like she makes him like empty his pockets and then closes his eyes. And then while his eyes are closed, she like kind of like grabs his wallet and like sifts through his wallet and like just to gather some personal information on him. Right. Right. So, you know, she leads him down this just really strange path. that's just not accurate. But I kind of felt that same way, like I was being taken advantage of. So I, I swore off things like that for a long time. And this happened to me when I was like 18 or 19 years old. I had I was in college and I was like, oh, I'm I had just started to like develop an interest in this sort of otherworldly stuff. And then but that experience and then actually a psychedelic experience I had with mushrooms kind of like turned me off to everything and I kind of shut down and just went through like a really dark time because I had I had a really bad trip my first time on on shrooms and mm -hmm. But anyways, I'm kind of rambling here. I wanted to get back on track. I've talked with people on this podcast about spiritual alchemy, you know, taking this occult science of turning lead into gold and applying it to your own psyche and your own spirit. And I know you're familiar with things like alchemy and also magic, which we've been talking about, and, and how those practices can assist one's spiritual growth psychedelics obviously assist in that same spiritual growth as well but i was wondering if if you know of anyone who's ever practiced alchemy or magic while on psychedelics and if you think that that would you know if you're trying to shape and shift your reality that being high or on a trip while doing that would would help it along or would maybe hinder it i actually talked to sarah about this because she's a tarot card reader and i asked her if she did any psychedelics when she was on tarot cards or reading tarot cards and of course she did i think she took lsd when she was on uh, when she was doing a reading one time and um i'm not sure how much it helps because i feel like they're totally different arts you know what i mean like i feel like when you're on lsd yeah things become more vivid and your your aura is being dropped or there are things happening to you spiritually but also i, I feel like 
tarot cards are a different game. I don't know. When I asked her about it, she said that things were heightened and things got more trippy. But I didn't get the sense that she meant it would help and benefit in greater ways than when she was sober. You know what I mean? So that's definitely an interesting area that I would like to develop more into, though. But, you know, I, I, that's the only one that I know of so far is Sarah being on LSD and reading tarot. But I haven't actually heard of people performing sigil magic or any of those things while being on psychedelics. The closest thing, I guess, would be shamans of the Amazon. They would perform these rituals and sing ikaros and do these um, dances and and just occult symbolism rituals while they're on ayahuasca. So that would be the closest thing. And what they're doing is very occult. You know what I mean? Like they're... They have their own cosmology of the world. They have their own spirits and their plant medicine spirits. And everything is kind of a religion in the Amazon. I don't want to say religion because that has a negative connotation, but it's sort of like that. You know, they have their own ideologies and gods that they invoke as spirits and things like that. And I think what they're doing is very occult and they're definitely on some psychedelic. So that's probably the closest thing I feel like that you're talking about with alchemy, uh, magic, and also psychedelics. When you talk to shamans of the Amazon, they basically combine all those three things and take it up a, a trillion knots. And, you know, they invoke so many spirits and to heal you and to show you the way of life and to have you experience death and life and other life and other animals' life forms. I mean, I talked to Jason Havey, who actually lived a bear's life in his ayahuasca trip he he was actually a bear for the entire life and he experienced the life in under five minutes so it's it's amazing man i mean i don't know what they're doing exactly down there but they're doing some amazing things yeah that's kind of what inspired that question was you know that that shamanic experience because they they are performing ritual magic you know it, it's mm-hmm. not yeah it's it's not this sort of like you know this dark you know pentagram type of magic that you see <laughs> it's more but it, it is a ritual and right. it's informed by their own culture and their own experiences and they are high on something or, or, or tripping on something so that that's just what i was wondering is if just from your own experiences of, of talking to people who have you know been on ayahuasca journeys and and you know dmt trips if if they've ever experienced that sort of that sort of magical quality of, of ritual and symbolism. And cause I, I've heard people that go to these, these ayahuasca retreats that, you know, they're in like shacks with like symbols on the wall and stuff. And I'm like, that's, that's magic. That's magic. Yeah. Whether you see it as magic or not, that you are being ritualized in that sense. And it's kind of scary cause you got to find shamans that you trust. Right. But right. That's what inspired that question. I forgot that you had asked Sarah that, but yeah. But you know what, man? Like, there's a lot of negative connotations when it comes to magic. People think magic is some kind of weird witchcraft and spells that would invoke negative consequences to other people. But to be honest with you, when you're setting intention in the morning, when you're meditating, that's magic. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot of things that we're doing already are already magic. We just don't know it. So, I feel like a lot of people don't understand these things that surround us are really magical already i mean i have a picture of the flower of life framed on my my bed and um i look at it before i sleep i look at it when i wake up and it it gives me a good vibration you know and sometimes i get super stoned and i go to bed and i look at that picture and i'm just like whoa i'm blown away (laughs) by all the symbology that's hidden within that simple flower of life picture and it's really trippy and but the things that we're doing already, a lot of things are already really magical. We just don't think about it. We think about magic in terms of spells and drawing pentagrams and Star of David and burning incense and burning candles. Of course, that's a big part of it. But there's also a lower level magic or more simple ones that we're already doing, most of us in the psychedelic world, maybe burning incense, burning candles that are already part of the magical realm. And it's already a spell. We just don't realize it because it's so popular, you know. Yeah. And there's that that quote that um you know magic is just like technology that we don't understand yet. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that. And I, I don't really know what to make of that. It, it's kind of a cliched quote in the occult world these days, but I think there's something to that. And it also makes me think of of technologies 
like we interact with, you know, we we all have iPhones or, or Androids or whatever, tablets, whatever. But there's also this this surge in, in virtual reality now, and this is something I've I've heard you talk about about how how VR is pushing us toward uh, mindfulness or peace or awareness. And I heard you say that, but I've I've never seen VR that way. To me, I always saw <laughs> VR as like it's pushing us further into this matrix, this this reality that's been constructed for us instead of by right. us. But I am curious about your take on VR. Like, why do you think it's leading us toward a more mindful, aware, and, and peaceful state? <laughs> it's funny you say that because I don't think that way anymore. And I don't oh, know okay. when it was well, the last shit. time I, I thought about those things. But yeah. I'm not a big fan of VR. I'm just... I'm a huge fan of regular reality. You know what I mean? Like, I think VR is great. I think there there are many advantages that it could be used for, like disabled people or um, people that don't have access to a lot of things that they would have to, if not for VR. But I feel like what you said is very true. You know, it's pushing us more into the system that we've designed already. The, the older I get, the more I try to get out of the city i try to be more in nature and just be away from the system that we've designed for us and i feel like vr would push us more into that direction because ultimately somebody has to write the vr program right somebody has to design that world that's inside and you don't know what the intention is behind that programmer or the writer for that world and the more we get sucked into that world the more we're losing track of this reality that we're in i mean Look at us. We're already on our cell phones or computers basically half the day of our waking hours. And I can't stand it, to be honest with you. You know, I try to be off of my phone as much as I can, but sometimes it's just really hard because it's so addicting. But I feel, I feel like VR would take us onto a whole nother level of addictiveness and it would suck us in into these other realms that are not even real. Of course, somebody could say, Oh, well, what's real? Because what's in front of us is just an illusion so vr is just as much as of an illusion as the reality that's in front of us yeah you can say that but i can say for sure that you can't smoke dmt on vr and have the same effects because it has to be programmed by somebody you know it has to be designed and written by somebody and there are many things that vr could be used for but for the time being i just feel like it would di distract us from who we are and and what our mission is here on this planet. And I believe that's not VR. I believe like we're literally going to be plugging into the matrix and losing our identities mm -hmm. and just becoming these robot machines that, you know, these technocrats want us to become. So I don't, I don't want to become one of those things. And I want to be as organic as I can be while it's still possible. I know we're heading towards the direction of the machines and AI and stuff, which is a whole other topic, but. I want to remain as organic as I can be, whether that's with where I live or my mindset or what I eat, you know, my environment around me. So, yeah, I don't know. My, my mind changed all the time and I might feel differently about VR next week, but this is how I feel right now. Well, I think that's admirable, man, that I don't remember how long ago you said that or I heard you say yeah, it. Yeah, I probably said know. it, man. I probably said it. <laughs> I'm Yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm making it up, but... I'm pre yeah, so I thought that was curious because of the way that you think. You know, you're a very psychedelic thinker. And to hear you say that, like, well, VR is pushing us toward mindfulness, I thought, well, fuck no, it's not. It's actually just the opposite, <laughs> at least just from my perspective. So it's cool that you're able to pivot your own belief system, your own thoughts like that. And that I don't think it was very long ago that I heard you say that. So uh, <laughs> Kudos to you for being open to changing your own mind, which I think a lot of people are not open to that. I think more people are becoming that way, but uh, it's it's those deep-rooted beliefs that you have that, that really hold you back, I think. So it's nice to see that you're able to, to shift away from that and sort of see that in a different light. I can make an argument for mindfulness for VR, though. I just thought about it just now. So oh, go ahead. when you're it. copping into the VR goggles and you're seeing all those new landscape and imagery and animals, you're realizing deep down in your soul that this is not real this is just an illusion this is from a vr goggle this is from the samsung or whatever vr system that you're using and you're realizing this it's all fake and when you hop out of the vr world you can also have that sense of mindfulness say hey this is the same thing what if i'm in a vr right now that's so real that you can't tell the difference and you can have some kind of sense of awareness about 
your place in the world and how you shouldn't be so attached to things, how you should take things less seriously and how you should be more aware of your surroundings and just be more mindful of your thoughts and emotions because ultimately that's not who you are. That's just these programming and code that's encoded within us to make us react a certain way. So I guess I could make that an argument of VR gaining mindfulness. But yeah, you can go both ways, I guess. But, you know, for the, for the most part, like I, I'm not a huge fan of VR. I know like Duncan is, but I'm not on that that boat yet. I'm not I'm just not really convinced because I, I'm a big fan of waking reality I'm a big fan of what I am. I'm a big fan of you. I'm a big fan of mountains and trees and birds and buildings and you know normal things and real things and like things I can touch and real emotions. You know, I I love those things and people want to escape from it. And I understand a lot of people will take psychedelics because they want to escape our reality because they they can't stand this reality that we're in, so they want to escape into the other realm. And I feel like VR has the possibilities of that. It could definitely transfer you to another realm instantaneously. But for me, I'm a big fan of where I am and where I this this earth that we're in. Like I'm just a huge fan of it, man. Like I fucking love the earth, and I'm not trying to do a tree hugging session right now. But I'm just a big fan of like, like regular reality. I don't need virtual reality to make my life better. But that's you know, my, I'm not against it. Yeah, but that's that's my issue with things like social media. You know, like I don't want to immerse myself in your fucking Snapchat story, you know, because <laughs> because that's that's me like taking t- taking myself out of my own experience in my own life and then putting myself into into yours. And I feel very voyeuristic when I do that, and like yeah. I'm not really experiencing <laughs> what I want well, to. Definitely experience. not Snapchat stories. Definitely yeah. not that. I mean, yeah. if you want to play the whale game, that's fun. You know, that's that's <laughs> cool. You can swim underwater and stuff. That's really cool. But Snapchat, fuck no, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, I mean, I I use Snapchat. I actually, uh, you know, promote my podcast through it somehow, and it's just okay. people like gives it a glimpse into my own personal life for people that want to follow me, obviously. But so I'm not like hating on it. It, it is just a tool to promote things, just <laughs> like anything else. But I do feel that way. Like when I do click on somebody's story, I'm like, God, like, I, why do I care about what you're doing in your life? Like, it, it's it nothing <laughs> to do with mine. There is probably some use for it. I just don't know what it is yet. But I have one more question for you, and it's one that I ask. Well, I don't ask it to everybody, but I, I ask it to guests I have that I think can give me a thoughtful and unique response. So if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to ask you this this question. Let's do it. It's actually very simple. Um, Ed, what is love and what does it have to do with all of this? Oh, my God. <laughs> I was afraid of these questions. You know, I think... I think we have a big misconception about love. I think people in Hollywood or mainstream media like to make love into this thing where it's only available between couples, men and women, or um, whatever the case may be, between a romantic relationship. But I feel like that's only part of the story. Love is something that's an invisible force that binds everything together and it's one of the most powerful forces in the world and of course there's another side of that which is hate which is very similar to love it's only a nail away from love but they're operating on a very same level of passionate and powerful force that's the only way i can explain it is that when we're in love with the universe or when we're in love we're actually unlocking something within us that we are letting it flow. We're letting it flow to us and out of us and from every pore of our being in the skin. And when we're activated in that mode or when we're aware of that flow, we could be anything we want. We could feel the universe pulsing. You could feel the, the earth revolving around its access and you can have access to all the infinite possibilities of this planet of this universe that is what love is to me it is this this feeling of infinite possibilities and this feeling of bringing us together and binds us into who we are and it makes us it makes us human it makes us whole and i feel like it is one of the most powerful forces in the world because with love on your side you can accomplish anything in the world you can feel like a million or a billion dollars without having a single penny it is it is a force that is so so hard to to reach. It is one of the highest places 
I think that we could accomplish, you know, next to enlightenment is the feeling of being in love, being in love with the universe, being in love with yourself, being in love with the people around us. And once we reach that state, we can achieve this immortal happiness that everybody looks for. But that state is really hard to attain, also really hard to keep up because there are many things outside of ourselves that are forces that are trying to push us out of that state all the time. And in order to hold on to being in love, we have to have all those things in balance. And when things are out of whack and out of balance, we fall out of love and we become more hateful, more fearful. So love is this super powerful force to me that is basically my religion at this point because I feel like there are so much forces in the world that can control us. And the only force that I believe is the most pure and powerful is love. And that is what I feel when I was under those white lights, when I was taking that little nap on the edge of my bed was full of love. That was the only word that I could describe those powerful beings and of light were were sending me and i just want to i just want to say that people all the time want to say love is you know just red hearts or valentine's day or giving flowers or marriage of course that's a part of love but that's only two percent of the love that i'm talking about and until you feel that force of love you don't really know what i'm talking about because it is something you really have to feel you really have to let it come through you to feel the essence to really hone energy from that power and i don't know if i'm explaining it correctly or if i'm doing a good job of explaining what love is but that is what love is to me and it is an elusive state that is so powerful that i would do anything to to have and to me love is an ally you know love is my ally and it is the force that i try to channel whenever I'm going through tough times or whenever I wake up in the morning and I try to be more loving. And once I know that, then all things fall into place. Well, there is no correct answer to that question, by the way. There's only your answer, and I'm grateful that you shared that with us. Please do tell the people where they can drink more of your psychedelic milk. <laughs> psychedelicmilk.com and that is the place where everything is of course you guys can download the show on itunes on stitcher podcast addict and all those great things we're also on patreon so that's the best way to support the podcast patreon.com forward slash psychedelic milk we're 100 percent fan funded no ads no sponsors and we like it that way because i can't imagine going to a dmt trip with ads and product placements that would be pretty bizarre <laughs> so i want to keep the the experience as pure as it can be as loving as it can be so the only way that i can do that is through patreon so show us some love on patreon.com forward slash psychedelic milk and everything you can find is on psychedelic milk.com so check it out yeah and i should point out to the audience here that you recently dropped some sponsors which i thought was very admirable so kudos yeah i don't to know to be honest that. with you i don't know if it's a good move or bad one but oh like... no trust me it you don't want to be <laughs> beholden to corporate sponsors so it's nice yeah. that, that you made that choice I, I just maybe monetarily it wasn't a good decision for you at this moment but i think in the long run right. that'll pay off for you man I hope so, man. I hope so. So I'm praying because I'm really burning some bridges there and I'm not sure it was a good decision, but I'm sticking with it. So, <laughs> Hey, man. Stay true to you, my friend. That's all you got to do. For sure, man. Hey, thanks awesome. for uh, this conversation, man. I, I really enjoyed it and um, hope to do it again, man. I really enjoyed this conversation and I feel like this is one of the best interviews that I've ever done because I feel like this interview, like you really put out a lot of thoughtful and insightful questions out and I really, really enjoyed it, man. I really did. Awesome, man. I appreciate those comments and those kind words. I do take a lot of pride in what I do. I try to be professional, obviously. Not everybody who does a podcast these days. It seems like I got like six people on my block that do a podcast it's just, just so, <laughs> it's just so like ubiquitous these days like everybody yeah, has a podcast a right but i i think that's great too you know i we need new voices out there we need more voices out there talking about ideas like this and you know like i said i i do take pride in in trying to present you know enlightening conversations and information to people that find it valuable so you're doing the same thing i know you are and 
I commend you for that as well. So thanks for the time again, and I'll talk to you soon then, for sure. Thanks, Ryan. Fuck to the yes, Ed Liu coming through with some of that raw milk. Hope you enjoyed sipping on that psychedelic scissor. Oh god, that sounded stupid. <laughs> psychedelic syrup with us. Really enjoyed this chat with Ed. I dig his vibe. And he's so insightful and well-spoken. And please do give his psychedelic milk a taste. Just a taste. I'll tell you what though. Listening back to this conversation at this moment was a nice reminder to me. I struggle with some of what Ed and I were discussing regarding that elitist approach to spirituality. I urge my loved ones to step out of their comfort zones and pursue their individuality and spiritual development, and sometimes I do go about that in the wrong way. And frankly, that's not very kind of me. It doesn't make me any more developed than them, to be honest. I'd blame my sharp-tongued and impatient Scorpio nature, but really, I just need to be more patient and more compassionate, and more overstanding. We're all in this together, but we're also all walking our own path at our own pace, and we should all keep that in mind when interacting with one another. So this episode came back around at a good time for me personally, and I have to again thank Ed for reminding me of that and for sharing his wisdom here with us. I hope you found similar value in this one. And if you did find similar value, our value for value, listener-supported model, could use your support. If you dug this track and want more conversations like this, please do consider supporting the show by visiting oculturepodcast.com slash support and choosing from one of our three donation options. This allows me to record more episodes and longer episodes. There are two one-time options for PayPal and Bitcoin donations and a recurring monthly option through PayPal. I'm still prepping that Patreon campaign as well and I have actually set aside some time next weekend to hopefully finish it. I tried to schedule my interviews on the weekends and I built in a weekend off from interviews next weekend for myself so I can hopefully catch up on some things like the Patreon campaign and at least get closer to finalizing it. More on that over the next couple lunar cycles. But until then, you've just been initiated into O-Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, my God.